Hi, everyone. Welcome. And we will be getting started at the top of the hour in about one minute. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Celebrating Parks and Recreation Month, launching efforts to create safe and equitable access to parks. I am Danielle Sherman. I'm the Healthy Parks and Places Manager at the Safe Routes Partnership, and I'm really excited to be facilitating today's webinar where we're going to cover strategies for launching efforts to create safe and equitable access to parks. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I just want to let's share a little bit about our organization, Safe Routes Partnership. We are a nonprofit organization that works to advance safe walking and bicycling to and from schools. But we also focus on safe routes to healthy food and safe routes to parks, which you'll hear about today, uh, to improve the health and well-being of kids of all races, income levels, and abilities, and to foster the creation of a, a healthy community for everyone. So how we actually do that um, is that we really focus on improving the quality of life for kids, families, and communities. So we advance policy change at various levels. We also help to support various communities. Um, and we also share our expertise through you know, resources, um, various resources such as webinars and fact sheets. All right, so a little bit of housekeeping information. Um, to the left, you'll see the GoToWebinar viewer through which you're actually seeing the presentation now. Then to the right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can raise your hand, um, you can ask questions, and select the audio mode that works best for you, whether computer audio or phone call. Um, but please make sure that you note that the control panel will collapse. Um, automatically when it's not in use. So to keep it open at all times, you can click the view menu um, and then uncheck auto hide um, control panel. All right, so two options for listening to us today is a telephone um, and mic and speakers. So if you have sound problems with one selection, just try the other. Um, and vice versa, and then we'll do our best to field any issues that you may have through the chat box. Okay, so even though you are muted, we want to make sure that we are, you know, able to have your input, have you ask questions, share any comments. So please use the questions box to ask any of the speakers that are on the call today any questions. Um, for the Q&A portion that will be at the end of the webinar. And then we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. If we're not able to, please feel free to email me at danielle at saferoutespartnership.org and we'll do our best to get that information answered. After viewing today's presentation, you might want to view it again or send the link to your friends. Um, and so if that's the case, um, you can do that free by going to our website, saferoutespartnership.org, and clicking on the Resources tab um, heading, and then clicking on Webinars in the, le the list on the left-hand side of the page. Um, all past webinars you can find there, and it's a really great place to go and find a lot of information about what we do um, and the work that we're doing with various communities across the country. So please check it out. And then this webinar will also be there as well. All right, so in honor of Parks and Recreation Month, um, before I get to turn it over to like 
three awesome presenters today from three different communities across the country. Um, just wanted to share a little bit about um, Safe Routes to Parks, but you will hear today from three different communities who are um, making improvements to walking and bicycling facilities to create safe and equitable access to parks. That's how we're celebrating Parks and Recreation Month, which was which is July. Um, and you will he learn about key planning and implementation steps, some collaborations that you can form, um, funding, Danielle, this is Molly. I'm not sure if you can hear us, but your audio dropped off. Danielle, can you hear us? Yes, I, I am back. Okay. Yes, my okay, phone great. cut off. I my apologies. <laughs> Um, so you also will hear, um, like I mentioned, you'll hear about key planning and implementation steps today, any collaborations that you know have really assisted these communities in moving the work forward, um, funding options and other resources, as well as some sustainability ideas to help lead your own Safe Routes to Parks related efforts in your community. Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar with Safe Routes to Parks, um, just want to share a little bit about the history. So this initiative was developed through a grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provided to the National Recreation and Parks Association to support the Surgeon General's call to action on walking and walkability. The national partnership, um, we were invited by the National Recreation and Parks Association to work together with the Trust for Public Land and the Amer American Planning Association to create the Safe Routes to Park Action Framework, which you can see on the screen right now. Um, and so, then we got generous funding from the JPB Foundation to start the Safe Routes to Parks Activating Communities Technical Assistance and Grant Program, where we worked closely with communities across the country to develop you know, their plans, um, as well as implement an initial action from their plan on you know, improving or creating safe and equitable access to their local parks. So today you will not only hear from one of our 2019 um, awardees, but you're also here from two other communities that are doing this awesome work of creating safe and equitable access to parks. So just so you understand the, the framework that you, that you see on the screen is four main areas, assessment really focusing on identifying what park or parks that you're going to work on and figuring out what the, the state of the park of state of park access in your community, whether through walk audits, observations, um, surveys, focus groups, then trying to figure out from that community identified information, what are the priorities that you want to focus on, which is more planning. Then implementation, which we will go into today, which is, okay, what are the short, medium, and long-term steps that we could take to put the plan into action? Um, and that could be in different in design, um, programming and programmatic and policy initiatives that are focused on personal safety as well. And then sustainability, how are we going to keep moving this work for, forward? Um, not only thinking about funding, but thinking about in, including um, community members as well. How are we aligning our efforts, our current efforts with other community initiatives? The list goes on. And just noting that throughout all of these stages, each stage is heavily infused with proactive community engagement. So community, community residents really leading this work throughout. All right, so I am gonna start off today's, um, we're gonna kick off today's um, presentations with Kobe Takeda. Um, and he is our 20, a part of our 2019 Safe House Parks Activating Communities um, cohort. Kobe is the Community Program Manager for Blue Zones Project Hawaii, a well-being initiative to make healthy choices easier. In this role, he works with organizations, community leaders, and students to develop innovative programs, cross-sector partnerships, and effective health policy campaigns to move the needle on population health. Following his undergraduate studies at Willamette University, Kobe completed graduate degrees at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Schindler College of Business and the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health. So please welcome Kobe Takeda. Hi, 
so much, Danielle. I'm really excited to be here with all of you guys. Um, I'm in here in Honolulu, Hawaii, beautiful as it is. I'm not sure where you're from, but this is kind of what we're looking at today. Um, blue skies. This is a gorgeous park in the middle of our, our town area it's called Ala Moana Beach Park. Uh, and you can see in the background Diamond Head. So uh, I'm sure this is not your view every day, but uh, here in Hawaii it is. So I'm just really thankful to be here and share a little bit about Hawaii with all of you. So I'm going to fly through my slides here and share more about our work in Hawaii as well as our project um, to make our access to Old Stadium Park a little safer and, and more equitable. Um, but first, a little bit about Blue Zones Project. Um, we are a health and well-being initiative here in Honolulu. Um, we're across the state um, and in three different islands, and we do everything from working with schools, community organizations, work sites, restaurants, grocery stores to make the healthy choice the easy choice. Uh, we really work in, in that 70% in the middle that we know can help determine what our health outcomes are. You know, understanding that environment and healthy behaviors can have a significant impact on our on our out, outcomes. So, again, how can we use the built environment and policies and different changes in, in restaurants and grocery stores to make those differences? And it's all based on the Blue Zone research done by Dan Buettner and National Geographic, looking at where those Blue Zone areas are around the world. So, taking those principles, we implement these programs, and we actually have 48 communities across the country doing Blue Zone projects. And uh, here in Honolulu, we have eight. We're really excited to be able to share the work that one of our communities is doing in our Honolulu area. So here's a little map of Honolulu, just to give you guys a, a sense of where we're located um, on the island of Oahu. Um, our park, Old Stadium Park, is right there in the center and urban core of Honolulu. It was actually uh, about eight and a half uh, acres. Um, it actually used to be a stadium a long time ago, a place where Elvis Presley and different people like um, uh, Billy Mays used to play. So really exciting to see this uh, being part of our project because it has so much history and so much uh, personal connections to people in Hawaii. People went to go to rodeos here, they went to hula competitions and concerts and, and got to see the major leaguers play. Of course, things happened over the years and it, it, it transformed from a stadium to a park and, and since then has gone, gone through many different phases and, and recently hasn't been seeing the same amount of people that we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, many people, you know, used to learn how to ride bikes here and they went there with their families for picnics. Um, but over the years, uh, different social and, and environmental problems have kind of changed the, the state of it. But the Blue Zones Project has really been working to revitalize the space, you know, look at how we can integrate community members of all shapes and sizes, um, you know, all businesses, uh, different organizations, nearby schools to really take charge and, 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 and make sure that space can be enjoyed by everyone. So we've been doing everything from cleanups, We've had a couple of community meetings, looking at how we can re-envision the space. Uh, we've held yoga classes there to kind of get more people to the park. Uh, we even partnered with the University of uh, um, Hawaii and Arizona State University Design School to host uh, a design competition to kind of look at how we can uh, re reimagine the space with different uh, ecological health uh, implementations involved as well. Uh, we, we've partnered with Biki Bike Share Hawaii uh, to kind of get more people to bike in this park again. And it really is all about how do we build the momentum and how do we get excitement around this park so that we can, we can redesign this space through a formal master plan. So of course, we were really excited when we got the word that we were accepted as activating communities uh, grantee for the Safe Routes park, to Parks um, and, and through this National Parks um, park Partnership. Uh, we're really excited to work with um, a great team at, at the Safe Routes Partnership and, and specifically Marisa Jones, who really guided us through the process. And I'm gonna share with you guys how we kind of implemented our work through the framework. So I hope Danielle's proud of me because I'm gonna use the framework here and to, to kind of share how it really guided us and helped us through this project and, and really led to a, a great outcome. So first, engage. That, that initial step really was something we started about a year and a half ago before we got the, the grant, but really was supported by the work, we, the work we were able to do with the other grantees. You know, we had a lot of the webinars and discussions about what is what is the park um, supposed to be uh, created for and who is it for and, and, and what are the different populations and the voices that aren't always heard? And so really understanding equity and access was, was, a, was a great benefit up for us uh, through this process. And, and we're able to reach out to new stakeholders and really see who can integrate into our work, um, not just to hear their voices, but also to make them part of the action to make this, this project better. 
So we really found a lot of new stakeholders um, and it really, really drove our, our work on, on how do we assess the place? How do we look at um, what, what conditions the park is currently in? Um, pretty shockingly, and it was, it was only after we, we did this work through the, um, the different grantees and through our technical assistance that we were able to see how really th there's, there's a problem with um, the crashes at this, this intersection right at the corner of, of Eisenberg and King Street. So I'm not sure if you can see it there, but that really big dot in the middle of the screen it is actually a depiction of the crashes here. Um, over the course of, of several years, um, it had 67 motor vehicle crashes um, in between two different parks. So certainly a problem area, a high collision uh, zone, and it really allowed us to rethink how we can use this, this opportunity to um, spend some money, but also get some technical assistance to address that concern. We're able to also, um, this is also the site of a, of a complete street. It's actually the very first complete street um, project here in Honolulu, really to test out what a redesign and, and a more um, safe street could look like if it was transformed through engineering and some education. And so this is actually the first site of um, what many we, we call bulb out. Um, you know, this, this opportunity to give more access and give more space on the street back to the pedestrian to shorten the crosswalk lanes, to um, make it more visible, and even add some things like planters and trees and, and some different um, signage. Um, so here is actually the first site that they did it on, on Oahu. Um, as you can see, the, the bulb outs weren't very really maintained very well. Um, if you look in the far end of this, this picture, it, the bulb out actually used to be white and it's now black and blackened by tires. And so we knew there was a big concern, a problem with this um, intersection that we could come in here and, and revitalize both the paint, but also bring some color to the um, bulb out itself. Here's a little overhead of the uh, design for the bulb out. So you can see it, it does reduce the, um, the um, angle of the curb, so it really slows down traffic as they turn, but also creates uh, more space for the pedestrian to walk in at shorter distances on the crosswalk. We also did an assessment, look at some of our data that we collected um, this is some data we collected from our a survey we, we put out last year, um, really looking at what are the interests and concerns of this park and, and based on our, our visitors and where they're from and what their interests were, how can we really meet those needs? And so we had lots of data from not just our, our local agencies, but some of what we did in the community. We had some focus groups and, it, and this, this project and this grant really allowed us to look at, you know, who are those voices and, and, and who's missing from the conversation? How do we get that? those inputs um, to be important and, and included. Planning, once we really figured out what our project would be, which was to paint the bulb outs at the, the intersection of Old Stadium Park, um, planning what was a, as a, as a fun, exciting journey. Uh, and I really wanna thank Marisa and Danielle for helping us throughout the process because they gave us so much insights and resources and, and ideas on, on what we were thinking about, you know, what are some supplies we needed? What are some permits that we have to look into? Um, what are some considerations we have to make when deciding what paint to use and, and how do we capture this event through, through videography and photography and get the media involved? Um, for us, it, it, this is not something that we normally do. And I think for the city of Honolulu, it's very new to them as well. And so they're really excited to learn through this process on how does a community come together and really drive change in the community through design and art? And, and what was that, that process look like and how can more people replicate this? So throughout the process, it was really about documenting what did we do? What are the steps we took? How long did it take to get this done? What are some opportunities to change that process? And how can we help other community members in the future to do similar projects like this? And so certainly with the permitting process and, and looking at what needs to get done before this, this project could happen, um, we, we ran into some challenges, but at the end of the day, we were able to get it through. So I really want to um, thank everyone for helping us out. We also, in the planning process, looked at some other designs of how other communities use bulb art artwork and what those look like. And then we decided to host this week-long project. It was, a, it was a three days of in-class and out in the field, um, research and assessment and designing, and then actually two days of implementations. We actually went out there and over the course of the week brought community members together and all these partners and, and really assessed what does this community need? What does it look like now? How do we integrate art and design and, and different innovations to make this an, an active and exciting park again? So we had visitors come in from the outside. This is uh, an arborist who came and talked about trees and urban design and trees. 
Uh, we brought a historian in to bring in some old photos of the park and, and what it used to be before it was a park, before the city was, was there with the, the streams and the different wetlands. Um, talk about the caves that used to be um, surrounding this area. And this is really important because we use this in our design of the, the art. We looked at some old maps of the area going back to 1902. And you can see there the wetlands and how it used to be um, have this area where the water would, would hit the, the stream water from the ocean. Um, community members went out, we did a walk audit. We looked at what was currently there in place. How can we make it safer and make it more um, enjoyable of a walk to the park? We had a representative from the city come and talk about safe streets and complete streets. Um, someone talked about age-friendly design and how we can integrate these into our bulb outs. We really had a lot of great ideas that we shared uh, with each other and, and looked at how we can use the different elements of the history in the artwork. And so eventually we came up with these designs that, that integrated fish and ponds and water. And we actually went out there and painted it on Thursday and Friday. So on Thursday, we went out there and, and um, learn how to paint first in the classroom. And then we went out there and actually did it. So it was really great to see um, community members coming together. We painted the curbing on one day uh, in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we were back out there and we were painting the, the actual artwork with our, our design and artists and our students. Really great to see different people coming together and, and using different uh, methods of art and design and, and color and, and seeing them really excited about this project. Um, People off the side of the street actually wanted to jump in and help us out, so they did so. Um, these are some pictures from our Friday, our last day, where we also held the pop-up park event. So you can see here some of the exciting things we had at the park was games and we had some biking, but it was also really to drive attention to what we were doing in the park, but around the park as well with the, the bubble the artwork. So um, some of these people that came for the pop-up event actually came out and helped us out to paint the bubble as well. Um, we were mixing paint getting excited about putting paint down and, and bringing color and life to this intersection. It was really great to see community members of all um, shapes and sizes and backgrounds come out and help out. So here are some of the final designs and, and art that actually came out of it. Um, you can see we, we added lots of great color and, and put some history and culture into this space. And I'm really excited to see if this can really brighten up both the park as well as address safety and access around the park. We also got some great news coverage about the space, and, and um, this is our kind of our, our sustainability plan. So we're gonna we're gonna work on a maintenance agreement with the city to kind of help maintain the space after and get some businesses involved. And we also have plans to paint a mural and planters around this area. So we're really excited about that as well. A lot of lessons learned, and really about you know understanding the what's what's required to get this job done. Um, working with public agencies and being kind of pushing them a little bit, but also being respectful. And our key politicians really helped us along the way. Uh, but really, because the community came together and really wanted this and, and, and showed that they were interested, I think it helped to get the approvals process. And um, the, the last one here, when storing paint, use high quality containers. And I only said that because uh, we had a couple of spills in our cars. And so certainly a lesson learned was to use really good quality containers. But um, yeah, I really want to thank everyone for coming out and, and listening to us today. I um, really want to thank Marisa again. She was our rock star and is featured in this picture here. But uh, I look forward to hearing other presenters and answering the questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kobe. That was really interesting to hear about, like, just from the start to finish. I really did appreciate hearing even how you showed how it all flowed through the framework. That's very helpful, I think. Um, so we will move on to Megan. We have already gotten some questions for you, so we'll we'll come back to that at the end. So next we have Megan. Megan Butts, she is um, the Transportation Planner and GIS Senior Analyst. She joined the Upper Valley Lake Sunapi Regional Planning Commission in April 2014. She has a master's degree in energy policy and climate from Johns Hopkins University and holds a certificate of science, technology, and international security. Megan is the primary transportation planner in the region where she works with the state DOT and municipal entities to develop a regional perspective transportation planning and projects. She has also worked with many communities in the region by performing data collection and analyses, drafting transportation um, corridor plans, participating in climate-related forums, 
and providing transportation and GIS technical assistance. Megan um, played a really key role in the success of the City of Lebanon's Safe Routes to Play project plan and implementation, which you'll hear a little bit about today. So thank you so much, Megan, for joining us. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks for having me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some of the successful projects that came out of the City of Lebanon, New Hampshire's Safe Routes to Play initiative. The City of Lebanon is located in Western New Hampshire on the Connecticut River, and it borders the state of Vermont in what we call the Upper Valley. It's a rural city uh, with a population of about 13,000 people, and it's uh, home to the state's largest private employer, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical, Medical Center, with Dartmouth College in the neighboring town of Hanover. So a quick background on the initial project of Safe Routes to Play. Um, Safe Routes to Play is a child-centered transportation planning process that helps communities assess the potential to create non-motorized connectivity between neighborhoods and parks, playgrounds, and trails for children and their families. Um, a key component to the Safe Routes to Play involves youth engagement strategies to gather perception of their community safety, their independent travel, and challenges in choosing active transportation. Uh, we, had a, we had a lot of partners for this project, um, including Healthy New Hampshire Foundation, the Upper Valley Healthy Eating Active Living, the Trails Alliance, the Dartmouth Hitchcock Hospital, and the City of Lebanon, along with myself at the Upper Valley Lake Sunapee Regional Planning Commission. So the key component to the success of this project was public outreach. Um, we did a series of mapping exercises in four different neighborhoods um, that included walking tours. We also participated in mapping exercises at two school open house events. And we distributed parent surveys online in both hard copies at all of the daycare centers and schools in the city. So here's a map of the city. Um, we, the team divided the city into nine neighborhoods and mapped the locations of recreation spaces and re residential areas with young children. Uh, during the public outreach events, participants were asked to point out places on the map that they liked to recreate, the safe routes or that they walked or biked to get to these destinations, and the safety barriers on these routes, uh, which caused them to drive their own vehicles as opposed to walking or biking. There are four key themes from these public meetings and the walkabouts, uh, and they were improving existing playgrounds for children of all age groups, completing the Mascoma River Greenway, which you'll hear about in a few minutes, exploring opportunities for new trail connections, and addressing locations with safety concerns. Now let's get to the projects. The first project I'm going to talk about was located in the Sachem Village neighborhood. This neighborhood is primarily res residential, has a large sports complex and hockey rink, but also abuts the Connecticut River, which provides an array of recreational opportunities. The list on the right shows four improvement strategies that were developed in the plan for this neighborhood. The strategies in bold have been progressed since the plan was finalized in 2014. The first one listed there to construct a project to install a rectangular rapid flashing beacon and pedestrian refuge island at an intersection with New Hampshire Route 10 was the main topic of public outreach events in this neighborhood. This is the main north-south route between Dartmouth College and the residential and commercial areas in West Lebanon. And the intersection is also home to a transit stop and like I said, the large recreational sports complex. We tackled this strategy in a cooperative effort with myself at the Regional Planning Commission, the state DOT, and the city, as well as the neighborhood residents. The feedback from the community regarding safety supported by traffic and crash data sparked the Regional Planning Commission to apply for a road safety audit with New Hampshire DOT. The intersection itself is a combination of state and local roads, so the teamwork with all the partners was key. There have been 16 crashes at this intersection over the past 10 years, with one being a fate with, with one fatality involving a pedestrian. Unfortunately, this fatality happened, but it was what got DOT to accept the application and they hired a consultant to perform the, the road safety audit study. This study allowed the project to be eligible for highway safety improve, improvement program funding. And the goal of that program is to achieve significant reduction in fatalities and serious injuries on all public roads.
A median re refuge island and rectangular rapid flashing beacon what was chosen as the right project for this location. To save time, the city of Lebanon agreed to negotiate right of way with the abutting landowners and everything went well, except there was supposed to be another transit shelter on the, the left side of this photo here, but that didn't work out. Throughout the process, there were multiple meetings, with residents and the city council to keep everyone up to speed. This project was completed less than a year after the Safe Routes to Play process was completed. The next project I want to talk about briefly has its core in the city center, but spans onto the Miracle Mile neighborhood and the Seminary Hill neighborhoods. The city center is a mix of residential and businesses, and it is the most densely populated neighborhood in the city. There are many parks, playgrounds, trailheads, and recreational opportunities in this area. The list on the right shows the five improvement strategies that were developed in the plan. The first one the, to complete the Mascoma River Greenway project to ensure neighborhood level pedestrian and bicycle connectivity with downtown Lebanon and West Lebanon Village was the most talked about project throughout the whole Safe Routes to Play project, process in all nine neighborhoods. So if you're looking at the map, it's kind of hard to see, but right here around the letter A is, is where the Northern Rail Trail goes to the right here, goes east. And the dashed line to, going to the left is the proposed Mascoma River Greenway. The Safe Routes to Play plan talks about barriers parents experience that prohibited the use of active transportation to get to places they like to play. We we're able to point out this observation to the city that there are lack of sidewalks speed of the traffic of the adjacent routes in the downtown and lack of safety at intersections. This boosted the Greenway's funding and pushed it to the top as a priority list. The Greenway is cited several times in, in this plan, but it's also referenced in many other plans. The maps included in the Safe Routes to Play were a key piece to telling the story of where our youth live along the Greenway and also along those busy roads. So the goal is to get those people off of the busy roads and onto the greenway. The city worked closely with a local nonprofit called Friends of Lebanon Recreation and a group of volunteers that spearheaded the fundraising and public outreach about the project and were able to raise enough funds to implement a large piece of the project. City staff was able to use some of the language developed in the Safe Routes to Play project to help demonstrate real data that has been obtained in the public offered comment to points to need for the Greenway during the capital improvement plan process. So the funding came from both the nonprofit and the capital improvement plan for the city. So here's a picture of a map of, of the proposed Greenway and I'll show you what, what got completed here. The section of the Greenway that is now completed starts at the existing segment right here in the red and continues a mile and a half west all the way almost getting to this Riverside Park here. The Greenway connects people to local parks, no cost recreational opportunities and short term destinations like shopping centers and restaurants without the need of a car or public transportation. Additional connections are already in progress for the Greenway, including the downtown tunnel project. There's a tunnel that goes underneath businesses and parking lots right down in the city center that has been closed for a few years now due to safety issues. The city has now funded and is in the final stage of design to reopen that tunnel and connect the Northern Rail Trail in green to the new extension of the Mascoma River Greenway via that tunnel. This will connect nine, five of the nine neighborhoods together on this trail. Since the Safe Routes to Play plan was adopted in, in November of 2014, the city of Lebanon has moved forward on more than half of the strategies listed in the plan touching each neighborhood in the city. While the primary focus of the project was on safe transportation, the success of this project has been seen in other ways throughout the city, including addressing the need for play structures for children under the age of five. The play structure in this picture was built as a result of the Safe Routes to Play parent survey. 
The city continues to use the Safe Routes to Play plan as a guiding document to support the implementation of needs of its of the needs of its residents. And I think that's it for me. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Megan. That is awesome. Awesome work. Thank you so much for sharing about Safe Routes to Play and to see how it's really very much tied to what we do at Safe Routes to Park. So thank you. Um, and next up and last, we have Suzette Morales. So um, Suzette received her bachelor's of science degree in civil engineering at North Carolina State University and her master's in civil engineering with a transportation focus at the University of Idaho, Moscow. She began her career working at West Virginia Division of Highways as the assistant state pavement engineering. Um, she then began her path in transportation planning and engineering with um, the North Carolina Department of Transportation as a transportation engineer. Um, focused on developing comprehensive transportation plans and working with metropolitan and rural planning organizations. Um, Suzette currently serves as a transportation di division manager for the town of Wake Forest in North Carolina. Um, and in her spare time, she obsesses over playing tennis, watching tennis matches, and working out at Burn Boot Camp. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, Suzette. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to do a general overview of the town's perspective for how the town of Wake Forest does its own safe routes to parks. Uh, I'll provide a quick summary of the types of parks and facilities that we have, the different types of plans that we have, and then we'll also go over one of our planning maps. And then I'll also follow two park examples. So one park that you would consider has adequate safe routes, and then another one which could use some improvements. And then I'll continue with discussing how the town funds these projects, and then the way that the town encourages people to use other modes of transportation to get to those parks and other town facilities. Okay. Okay, so the Town of Wake Forest is located in the Triangle region of North Carolina. The population sits around 43,000, but the town continues to grow at a rapid pace due to its proximity to downtown Raleigh, the capital of North Carolina, and the Research Triangle Park. It is faster than what was estimated in the uh, town's transportation plan. So um, we are part of the Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. That MPO serves a population of about 1.2 million and is expected to grow to 2.1 million by 2045. The town has 12 parks, 14 miles of paved greenways, and 35 miles of planned additional greenways. Including these areas and our open spaces, we manage 561 acres. Coverage for access to parks, trails, facilities, and wake forest is fairly good. About 85% of the land area has access to at least some town provided amenity within a one mile proximity. The southernmost part of the town has the least access and the town wants to improve their, their access. Wake Forest has been recognized as a tree USA municipality and has continually held that designation for the past 40 years. Wake Forest is a green community and its residents want it to remain that way. So we need to be able to plan for that and plan for growth at the same time. Planning for the short term and long term future is very important for manageable growth for Wake Forest. These are a list of the relevant planning documents that the town has completed. The 2019 Comprehensive Transportation Plan combines both the old bicycle, pedestrian, and transportation plans. It's anticipated to be adopted by October. With each of the plans, so the, the Comprehensive Transportation Plan, the Parks and Rec, and Open Space Greenway plans, one of the goals in each of them is to provide accessibility to key areas around Wake Forest and accessibility for all people. Each of these plans look at locations of parks, schools, public facilities, 
and key business areas and see how people can get there via roadway, transit, bike, and or pedestrian facilities. The, we did a survey in our 2019 comp plan where we asked people to pinpoint locations where they live, work, and play on a map. And the, many of the parks that the town has were highlighted for places that residents wanted to play. We reviewed our previous plans to see what type of access those areas had and to see how we can improve on those and add new recommendations if needed. The town's unified development ordinance has requirements for developments for open space and parks that they must provide. They must take into account the town's adopted plans. The UDO also notes that all new developments are to provide neighborhood parks and undisturbed open space with the intent to ensure that each new home has a range of parks and open spaces within a walking or biking distance of a quarter to half mile. The town staff reviews each site development plan for conformity to this and other standards. This is a recommendation map taken from our open space and greenways plan. The map is split into two, it's really big. So the next map will show the southern portion. The map indicates location of parks, schools, and open spaces. The, the existing and planned routes are shown. So the dotted green lines and purple lines are greenways and multi-use paths. The red are sidewalks. And you can see in our northern portion, we have Joyner Park, Flaherty Park, and also our reservoir. So those are some of our important uh, key important parks and we want to make sure that we have get we get accessibility to those areas. This plan was done in 2009 so some things have changed. We've had more development so we've had more sidewalks and then one of our planned greenways has been built. And so in the southern portion um, there aren't as many parks. There are very very few parks and we but we have plans for people to get access to the ones that exist the southern area this dotted line right here this is our smith creek greenway so once that gets connected it will provide access from people all the way from clayton to wake forest so that's about 30 40 miles of greenway so um, once we get this is already in design and so once we get it built, we'll have this connection and it'll close this existing gap that we have. So with that, we'd be able to provide access to residents who live in the southern area of the town. So like I said before, I'll give you two examples of parks that we have, one that has a pretty good safe route access and then another one which doesn't. So our first one is Kiwanis Park. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty good example of state routes. Uh, the, I'll have another slide right after this, which shows the general location of the park. It's a very small, but well-used park space. It's located next to a library, which then offers um, easy access. There's um, the park and the library combination gives you plenty of parking. And there's also availability of restrooms and drinking water inside. There are also lights at the playground for evening and nighttime play when we have pretty good weather. So for this um, and the next park, I'll give you the I'll, a bit of discussion of explaining their accessibility for different modes of transportation. So I said the park is located between the library, which is the library is right here. And uh, then this is their EMS station. So the park is right in this location where my arrow is. There's accessibility by vehicle because we have plenty of parking, which is shared with the library. All non cul de sac roads within the park's half mile radius have sidewalks on at least one side of the street. And also within that half mile radius, we have park speeds of the park. There are speeds on the roadway about 25 miles per hour which allows bicyclists and vehicleists to share the road. South Franklin Street, which is on the right side of the screen, that particular road has bike lanes on both 
sides of the street. There's also a bus stop near the library, which I'm circling right there with the little bus symbol. That is another mode of transportation that provides accessibility to the park. The town has a circulator bus called the Wake Forest Loop, and that's free for everyone to use. There's also a nearby Greenway Trail, the Kiwanis Park Greenway. It does not provide direct connection to the park. You'll have to go from the Greenway to just a little bit of sidewalk before you get to the park. Um, but aside from that small improvement, overall the park meets the criteria for the area around the park would meet the criteria for a safe route to park. The next park is Ailey Young Park. The park is actually named after the Ailey Young family. They were the town's most prominent African-American citizens in the early to late 1900s as educators and public officials. The park has baseball fields, basketball courts, playgrounds, grills, and picnic area. The southern portion of the park is undeveloped, and the park is central for many neighborhoods of varying demographics. So here's a picture of the area around the Ailey Young Park. This is the active area, and the southern part is the undeveloped passive area. In terms of accessibility, there is plenty of parking for vehicles. Some pedestrians within the half mile area do have difficulty accessing the park. There are neighborhoods being built to the east of the park as we speak. Sidewalks are being built along that frontage. However, there's like a tenth of a mile gap between those areas and the park. That area is grassy and it does not have any ADA accessibility. There are no sidewalks in the older neighborhoods to the north, south, and west. There are some who live less than five minutes away if they have direct access by walking, but they must walk 20 minutes to reach the park. And I'm mostly talking about this particular area right here. They have to go all the way around instead of having a straight shot access. So that does provide them difficulty because there's minimal um, pedestrian access for them. The access to the park is along a two lane, 35 mile an hour road with no shoulders, which is not conducive to bike riding for the less experienced. There is a nearby transit stop, which is a uh, five minute walk to the park, but that was on sidewalk. There are no existing greenways to the park. To help with accessibility, the town has designed the Dun Creek Greenway Phase 3, which has a spur which will connect to Ailey Young Park. There will also be improvements to the park itself, which calls for closing that 10th mile gap of a sidewalk that's along Juniper, and then also providing more parking, which will then act as a trailhead for the Greenway. The design of the Greenway was recently completed, and the town is now in the process of acquiring the right-of-way. Access to the Greenway would be within the neighborhoods as well, so they have that slower speed so that bicyclists can get from the neighborhoods onto the Greenway to get to the park. And those who did have that 20 minute walk would now have that five minute walk to the park. In order to build all these things that we planned, like everyone else, we do need money. We get money through our general funds and through our town bonds. These two funding mechanisms we use as matches for grants that we apply for. Most greenways and complete street roadway projects are funded through our MPO with either a 20 or 30% local match. We have received grants from the MPO and our county for property acquisitions and construction, and most of the design funds come directly from the town. Our Parks and Recreation Department also received a grant from ExoFit, and that was to put exercise equipment along the greenways and within our park. Every year we try to do at least two or three of the events listed on this page, on this slide. These events encourage residents to take other modes of transportation and just be more confident in taking these alternative modes to get to their destination. Last year we had a bike to school day where elementary and middle school students 
began their trip along the Smith Creek Greenway um, Soccer Center and Park and then rode along the Greenway to their prospective schools. Every year we have our bicycle safety fair to encourage, we encourage youth to bring their own bikes or to use town owned bikes to learn bicycle riding and safety skills. The bikes and trailers that the town provide is actually from a Safe Routes to School grant. Smart Cycling is a course that we have each fall for both adults and youth. Participants learn bike safety skills, they complete parking lot drills, and then they participate in a group ride along town streets and the greenway. These bicycle events are to teach participants how to comfortably ride on the road and discourage them from riding on the sidewalk. National Trails Day and 5K bring, brings awareness to the greenways, trails, and parks that the town has to offer. The event takes place in Joyner Park. It's one of our premier parks in the town. It has vast trails, fitness equipment, community events like concerts and movies, and we have festivals there. But the park, that particular park, actually needs some safe routes accessibility. So it lacks accessibility via bikes and walking and transit. But with our comprehensive transportation plan that we're doing, we hope to make improvements to that area so that there can be accessibility by non-vehicular modes. So the town of Wake Forest, we do have some successes in providing safe routes to parks, but we still have improvements to make. These improvements are listed in our planning documents as well as our UDO to ensure that future developments meet the town standards on open space and parks. Uh, we also wanna encourage people to walk and bike to parks and other town facilities, and we can do so pro by providing them a safe route to get there. Um, here's my contact information, so if you have any questions for me, um, that you think about after this um, webinar, then please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Suzette. It was really helpful to um, hear how you all are doing in North Carolina, um, which is my um, place of residence right now, uh, in terms of safe routes to park. So thank you so much, Suzette. And thank you, Colby and Megan as well. So now we are gonna get into some questions um, I am going to kick off the first question um, with Colby. There are a couple that kind of go together, Colby, so I'm just going to kind of read them out. And um, if you miss one, I'll just repeat it because there's a couple together. Um, so re in relation to the um, bulb out installation that you all did, what kind of paint did you use? Um, how long um, will it last? And what are your plans um, in terms of once the paint has faded? Sure. So we use the color paved paint, um, which actually has the grip, um, the sand in it already. And you can mix in different pigments into that color paved. So the, the base color is a, a plain uh, neutral. And then you add pigments into that to make different colors. And actually, the color lasts quite a long time. Um, if you saw the pictures that I, I put of the billboards before we put the artwork, that's the red that they painted um, back in 2016. So that's about three years and it still hasn't faded. Mm. Um, so it's pretty strong and it's the same kind of material that they use for like tennis courts. And so um, right, right now we don't plan on doing anything unless it needs more paint, but um, potentially the areas that were white, we might need to, you know, uh, re uh, just clean those areas. We bought a pressure washer to help clean them. Perfect. Thank you. And then um, one more. What is what was the process like to have volunteers work in the right of way? Um, and did you have to get like permit permits or have a traffic control plan in order to have the volunteers work in the right of way? Correct. We did have um, traffic control um, plan created, and we had some um, workers that helped to move cones that morning and send some traffic control. Um, and then as we moved from um, corner to corner, they moved with us. Um, this question is for Megan um, and anyone else who would like to um, answer. But in terms of, like, we were just talking about right of way, um, what is that process in terms of um, getting right of way um, from private property owners? Um, any any strategies that you would suggest um, for folks that are having that as a challenge or working on that? 
Well, the, the particular issue that I mentioned was that it was a business that was located in that residential area that um, they just didn't want to give up the land there for a little bus shelter. And I mean, it, it's a challenge anywhere you go. Uh, you just got to, the keys are to work yeah. with the residents and the abutters and to really keep an open communication ahead of time, I think, as, as opposed to coming in, mm -hmm. feels to them as a last minute taking my land, but really just kind of kind of showing like the bigger impacts of the project. And I think uh, that particular space had a lot of community outreach and ha did have a pedestrian fatality. And it was clearly evident that something needed to happen there. So I think that's why the city went ahead um, and just mm. started the conversations early, which I think helped in that in that effort. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, and Suzette, how important would you say um, it is to tie what you're doing or can you even get the work that you're that you want to get done like the example that were presented today without it being tied to some type of policy or plan it pretty much has to be tied to a plan so if we want to get property acquisition we have to show the homeowner or the business owner the importance of it um, we i mean we'll usually do um when we have it in the plan, we've had public meetings, we've had public involvement all the way through from the bigger picture plan uh, to when mm -hmm. we do the specific um, greenway plan. So there's always public meetings. We send out information to the residents in that area, letting them know about the event, and also we'll have um, interviews with those property owners outside of that just so that they can be aware of, of what's going on. But we always have to have some type of policy or, or we have to show them that this has been a plan in the making for a while. This is Megan. I would Thank second you. that. Um, I would second that that uh, for us in New Hampshire, if it's on a state route, in order to get any sort of funding, both the local plans have to have it and the regional plans have to have that project or listed as a pl in their plans. Perfect. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, and we did get a question about um, our cemeteries considered parks. Um, and I'm just going to share my information. I, I don't think they're considered as parks, but I have seen them used in um, the, kind of the same way as like spaces that, that like events can be held. But I don't think they're considered parks. Does Megan, Suzette, or Kobe have anything else to share about that? Um, I'm not sure if it is considered a park, but we do do um, cemetery tours and we have our public works people that take care of that area, but uh, I'm not necessarily sure if it is, but I can find out. Thanks, Megan. All right, so um, before we close out, is there one key ingredient that um, each one of you would share as like, was so necessary to move in the work that she discussed today forward? The public engagement piece was huge for me. This is Megan, uh, especially getting the younger kids involved and parents involved as opposed to just the, uh, where, where we're located, we're, we're an aging community. So we often get a lot of older folks input and we don't really consider the younger people and when it comes to parks and and walking and biking there was a key component as well as the visuals with the mapping yeah. during those uh it, those public engagement sessions and this is Suzette. Yeah, we're off. Oh. <laughs> um so Go we okay so the most important thing for us is awareness we get a lot of people who will call and say, hey, where's the nearest park? Or, uh, But there's like a you know a park around the corner for them. So it's all about um, letting them know through um, uh, meetings, through our, you know, community, um, our communications department, just making people aware that these, these parks exist and also to let them know what plans we have for them and how their money is being used to help improve the area. And I think for us here in Hawaii, um, this kind of project was very new to um, for our city and county and, and a lot of different agencies weren't familiar with how to work with the community and what permissions to give or what liability was in place or what had, what needs to be put in place in, in order to make this happen. So 
I think for us, we were really fortunate to have some really strong supporters within the Department of Transportation Services and other um, departments that really helped move it forward, even when their colleagues were a little hesitant. So I think just finding your mm. champions in different agencies and, and, you know, really holding on to them and asking them for advice because they know the inner workings and the bureaucracies of the, the different public agencies. And I think having that um, allowed us to get this done in such a short period of time. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Kobe. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Suzette. Um, before before we head out, just wanted to share a few things. Um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Safe Routes to Parks and the work that we're doing, um, we have several resources that you can find on the um, through that link at the bottom of the screen, saferoutespartnership.org forward slash healthy hyphen communities forward slash safe routes to parks. Um, and we have a resource that will be coming out about this very um, topic. So please um, keep a lookout on that on that web page for that. Also, you've probably heard about our wonderful conference that's coming up soon. Um, so please look out. Well, you, not, it's already been out, but registration has been open and it will be actually closing um, on October 4th. I think you can um, actually register on site, but Please, if you want to do online registrations, that's up until October 4th, and you can go to um, www.saferoutesconference.org, where we'll be talking about not only Safe Routes to School, but the broader topic of getting folks safely to various destinations. And then just as a, a reminder for those that may not know, as a part of the work that we do, we do offer um, consulting services. So if you're looking for customized trainings or workshops on active transportation topics, or assistance with planning, um, policy or program development or community engagement, please email uh, my colleague, Michelle Lieberman, at michelle at saferoutespartnership.org or visit our webpage, which you can see right on the screen, which is www.saferoutespartnership.org forward slash expert hyphen help. And thank you all so much for being um, engaged in today's um, webinar. And thanks again so much to our speakers. You offered such great information. And remember, everyone, you can get this webinar on our webpage um, in a, about a day. So thank you so much for joining us.